They say never ask a man if he's from Texas, because if he is, he'll tell you. And if he's not, why embarrass him by asking? Where does this Texas bravado come from? Why do Texans fly their flag so high and put it on practically everything? How does one state out of 50 carry with it so much pride, lore, and legend? Well, it's nothing new. It's a pride that was earned on the battlefields of the Texas Revolution, which is one of the greatest stories ever told. It's a Texas Revolution road trip. Come and take it. The story of the Texas Revolution is one that stretches for hundreds of miles across Texas. It's a story told piece by piece at dozens of important historic sites, but to pull it all together into one Texas-sized saga, well, we're here. At the Bob Bullock Museum, in the heart of Austin, just blocks from the Texas Capitol, sits the Bullock Texas State History Museum. The Bullock is Texas's flagship history museum, telling the ever-unfolding story of the Lone Star State and covering everything from our Native American roots, to French shipwrecks, to the oil booms and engineering feats that made modern Texas. And in the middle of that Texas timeline, starting in the 1820s, you'll find the story of the Texas Revolution, woven piece by piece into one narrative. And to take us through the timeline, here's museum director, Margaret Cook. So to understand the revolution, you have to understand kind of what came before that. Right? Uh -huh. Mexico has just won its independence from Spain. Everything is in turmoil. In the next eight years, they would go through something like four different presidents. And if you look at the map, you can see how vast Mexico was. Main seat of government, way down here in Mexico City. Uh -huh. And the Texas state isn't just Texas, it's Texas and Cohia, with its main governor down here in Saltillo. A massive territory governed by a remote dictator. The match was set. And in the southwest corner, showing off a popped collar, more medals than you can count, and an obvious comb over, the uncrowned monarch, excuse me, elected president, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. And in the northeast, Wearing buckskin that would make even Jeremiah Johnson jealous, the father of Texas, impresario impressivo, Stephen Fuller Austin. Tensions were high. So let's hit the revolutionary road with our first stop to Stephen F. Austin's booming colony west of modern day Houston. Welcome to San Felipe de Austin. If you've never heard of it, well, I'm not surprised. There's not much to see of the original town. At the beginning of Texas, San Felipe was not only one of our largest cities, but also the unquestioned political, social, and economic center of Texas. Our first capital in every sense of the word. This is a recreation of our very first capital building. Kind of cool. You look at the capital we have in Austin now and compare it to this, you realize what humble roots Texas started from. To give you the backstory, in the early 1820s, Austin received permission from Mexico to bring the first official settlers to Texas. And so he recruited 300 families, the old 300 we call them today. And with the promise of free land and endless opportunity, he led them to the frontier, choosing this site on the Brazos River as his headquarters. Virtually every person we know from Texas history came through San Felipe at some point. Under Austin's leadership, San Felipe flourished, a bustling riverfront community. But frontier life was hard. And to make it worse, a distant Mexican government seemed more interested in controlling the new colony than leading it. 
less than 50 years after the United States has just won its independence. Mexico's just won its independence. So all these seeds of independence are just stewing and, and sprouting. Exactly. I think it's been in Texan DNA from the very beginning because why do you start a new life? You might just be wanting new economic um, advantages based on the amount of land that you're being told is available, but you might be fleeing a murder charge, you might be fleeing a bad marriage, or like Moses Austin himself, you might be facing bankruptcy. Okay. So yeah. you set your sights on the next best thing. Uh -huh. And that at this point in time becomes what we know today as Texas. She just summarized many of the famous Texans we all know. They were not a perfect or proper bunch by any means. They had dark pasts and plantation economics, many bringing slaves with them to Texas. Different groups of settlers had tried to rebel multiple times, only to be quashed by Mexico's powerful military. But this time, these hot-blooded Texans were ready to make a revolution stick. In the meantime, we've got all of these back and forth tensions coming between Mexican army that is in place in what we know as Texas and the settlers who are there. And at the heart of one of these is this small cannon. The famed come and take it cannon. This one in the Bullock is a replica, but the real one sits down the road in the town of Gonzales inside the Gonzales Memorial Museum. You may be asking, what's the story on this cannon? Well, allow me to grossly oversimplify. General Santa Ana was sitting in his hacienda when the Texans came to ask for a favor. So Santa Ana loaned the Texans a cannon, but then, years later, Come and Take It wasn't written on a handkerchief, but on an old wedding dress, but it worked. And on October 2nd, 1835, this cannon fired the first shots of the Texas Revolution. Well, I mean, this thing's not gonna turn the tide of a war. Why was this? Why do you think this cannon was so important to them? It's a symbol of Mexican government doesn't care about us. See, we told you, they're taking away the one defense that we have against American Indian attack. They've left us out here on our own. No way they're gonna get this cannon back. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is our stand yeah. right here. It becomes a victory for the Texans, right? It emboldens them. But there are certainly much more difficult episodes ahead. There was no turning back, and both sides knew it. And so Santa Ana himself, along with thousands of troops, set out for Texas, ready to clean up this little insurrection. Five months after Gonzales, in March of 1836, a delegation of Texans met to up the ante in the town of Washington, just outside of Brenham, at what is now a state historic site. And here's park ranger Janice Campbell. Welcome to Washington on the Brazos. We're the birthplace of Texas right here. Of course, it was here in March of 1836 that we had 59 gentlemen meet in a general convention. In 17 days, they signed a Declaration of Independence from Mexico. They framed a constitution, elected officers for the new government that was created right here in Washington. Oh my gosh, wow. 
What are we looking at here? This is a replica of Independence Hall. This is hallowed ground, really, for Texans. It should be thought of that yeah, way. Yeah, I just feel it. Oh, yeah. Independence Hall was nothing more than a wooden shack owned by a local blacksmith. It's not much to look at, but its importance goes way beyond its appearance. We have one handwritten Declaration of Independence here in Texas, and of course it is housed in Austin mm -hmm. in the State Archives building. Over those long days, the delegation of Tejanos and Anglos shared their grievances and signed the Texas Declaration of Independence. And I'm going to read you guys a couple of my favorite excerpts. It's a pretty powerful document. <clears throat> when a government ha- All right, all right, one second. When a government ha- All right, this just doesn't feel right. What, give me a sec. Oh, yes, this is much, much better. When a government has ceased to protect the lives, liberty, and property of a people from whom its legitimate powers are derived, becomes an instrument in the hands of evil rulers for their oppression. It is the inherent and inalienable rights of the people to abolish such government, to create another in its stead, and to secure their welfare and happiness. We, therefore, the delegates, with plenary powers of the people of Texas, in solemn convention assembled, appealing to a candid world for the necessities of our condition, do hereby resolve and declare that our political connection with the Mexican nation has forever ended, and that the people of Texas do now constitute a free, sovereign, an independent republic. They signed the documents and sealed their fates. They knew that either Texas would win independence or they would die. And among the signers was the man who would eventually lead the charge, Sam Houston. However, any celebration was cut short as down the road in San Antonio, the battle was already raging in what was the 13 day siege of the Alamo. The Battle of the Alamo is a story we all know well. A small group of soldiers who were greatly outnumbered, yet willingly sacrificed their lives for the dream of Texas. This is Alamo expert, Bruce Winters. We tell a story bigger than the battle. Battle is what most people think about, but we have a history as it being a Spanish mission. Mission San Antonio de Valero, to be exact. One of five missions built in San Antonio. But after the mission period ended and the Spanish left Texas, well, the Mexicans turned the Alamo into a fort. And while most don't know it, there were actually two battles for the Alamo. The first, the Texans actually won. It was called the Siege of Bear. Texans are in revolt. And so as rebels, they've got to capture something important. Uh -huh. They capture San Antonio. Uh -huh. and so that's why Santa Ana comes back with soldiers. They have to take it back. What had been the Texans' proud fortress became their prison. And for 13 days, around 200 brave men fended off Santa Ana's army. That is until the morning of March 6th before the dawn, when Mexican forces stormed the walls. It's, it's very much like taking a bowl, putting it in a sink full of water, pushing it down, all the water starts rushing in. Mm. Battle took about 90 minutes. Like I said, it's in the dark. Mm. Um, we sometimes will have visitors who come here and say, I wish I was there. <laughs> no, you don't. Texas lost some of its best and bravest that day. And here on the grounds, all the stories we've heard since childhood become very real. Down here on the ground, the line, Colonel William Barrett Travis drew this and he said, listen, if you're in, cross the line. But if you're not, I want you to leave. And of course, all but one stepped across the line and joined him to fight. This is a spot where we believe Davy Crockett died and faced his final struggle. There's just so much history right here in front of the Alamo, it's crazy. And one of my favorite parts to every visit is reading Travis's famous letter. All right, so this is a copy of Travis's letter written from the Alamo seeking support for his cause. To the people of Texas and all Americans in the world, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans in Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment for 24 hours and have not lost a man. Our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. I call on you in the name of liberty and of patriotism and everything dear to the American character to come to our aid. I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country, victory or death. More than a building, the Alamo is a symbol of courage even in the face of certain death and of dying for something bigger than yourself. And while it may bring a wave of reverence and nostalgia today, well, it had a very different effect in 1836.
That battle was over in under an hour before daybreak. As the word gets out in the communities, everyone, of course, is, is not just devastated, they're angry. They didn't take any prisoners. They just executed everyone, burned their bodies. We're not gonna let this go, but we're also pretty scared. People start packing up what belongings they can carry on their backs in their wagons and start fleeing. This is what's known as the runaway scrape. When the once growing towns of San Felipe, Gonzales, and Washington were burned to the ground, leaving nothing behind for the Mexican army to plunder. But things were about to go from bad to much, much worse. You know, so many remember the Alamo, but too few remember Goliad. This is Presidio La Bahia. Today, the fort's walls stand as they did back in the 1700s. The Presidio has had a number of important roles in both Spanish, Mexican, and Texan history. This cannon, believed to have been used by Colonel James Walker Fannin and his men during the Texas Revolution, was excavated from inside the Presidio walls in 1936. Wow. Piece of Texas history right there. In the fight for Texas independence from Mexico, the Texian army took control of this Presidio. It was renamed Fort Defiance and came under the leadership of Colonel James W. Fannin. After the fall of the Alamo, Fannin and his men attempted to retreat from La Bahia to join Sam Houston. However, they showed no signs of haste as they made a leisurely retreat across the prairie. But General Urea and his Mexican troops were in hot pursuit and eventually caught up with Fannin and his men here on this field. While the outnumbered Texans fought hard and were able to hold position against a much larger army, many, including Fannin, were wounded in the fight. The long, drawn-out skirmish ended in a Texian surrender. Fannin and his surviving men were marched back to Presidio La Bahia to await their fate. For a week, the men were held captive in this chapel, waiting patiently but confident that if they just waited longer, they would be released. General Urea did ask Santa Ana that the men be granted clemency. However, after suffering huge losses at the Alamo, Santa Ana was in no mood for mercy and ordered that all prisoners be executed. On Palm Sunday, March 27, 1836, the men were placed into three columns and marched beyond the fort walls. Each column took its own direction from the Presidio, escorted on each side by a row of Mexican soldiers. The marching ceased, and from point-blank range, the Mexican soldiers opened fire on the unarmed Texians. The wounded men, including Colonel Fannin, were executed one by one here in this courtyard. Fannin was the last to die. After seeing all his men killed, the wounded Fannin was set in a chair. And as he awaited death, legend says he made three requests. That his personal belongings go to his family. That he be shot in the heart, not the face and that he receive a Christian burial. Soldiers proceeded to take his belongings, they shot him in the face, and they burned his body. 342 men lost their life that day in the Goliad Massacre. That Palm Sunday was one of the darkest days in Texas history. All must have seemed lost. But the other people that are key at this point are people like Sam Houston, who is leading this army, and we've got to make decisions about where to go to next. I try to put myself into Houston's mind at the time, and he must have thought he was uh, facing up against just impossible odds. He's just amassing any, any man with a gun who can march. I mean, did he think he was stepping into victory, or did he think he was making his valiant last stand? I think he was just committed. Whatever was going to happen, they were either going to come out victorious, or they were going to make a final stand that was going to go down in history. Yeah, right. If Houston had a plan, well, he didn't tell anyone what it was. He simply marched east. That is, until he hit the fork in the road. So this is New Kentucky Park. It's the site of one of the most important moments of the Texas Revolution that nobody knows about. You see, as Houston led the Texian army and all the settlers in what's known as the runaway scrape, he reached this site and he had to make a decision. There were two roads. The road to the left was the road to Nacogdoches, which ultimately meant safety in Louisiana. The road to the right was the road to San Jacinto to face Santa Ana and the Mexican army head on. 
Houston hadn't told anybody what he was going to do. However, when he reached New Kentucky, without hesitation, he marched his men to the right. They cheered and he crystallized the Texan spirit just like that. That happened right here. A simple turn to the left and we may not have a Texas at all. The time has finally come to visit perhaps the most important piece of earth in Texas, the San Jacinto Battleground. The place where Texas indisputably became Texas, independent and sovereign, now marked by the tallest monument in America. And what better place to start our exploration than up at the top? Whew, look at that view. We're hundreds of feet above the San Jacinto battlefield, which gives you the best perspective of the final battle of the Texas Revolution. It had been a hard few months for the Texans. Since the first shots were fired in Gonzales, the Texans had declared independence at Washington on the Brazos and suffered terrible losses at both the Alamo and Goliad. The powerful Mexican army now marched across Texas, sending settlers running in fear and burning their possessions in what's now known as the runaway scrape. However, instead of running to safety in Louisiana, Houston turned his army south to face Santa Ana head on at San Jacinto. Today, visitors see a battleship, a monument, and a state park. But of course, in April of 1836, none of it was there. The Texian army, numbering 900 men, camped west near Buffalo Bayou. Across the field, less than a mile away, camped the Mexican army, believing they had the Texans cornered. On April 20th, a small skirmish left two Texans wounded. And that same evening, 500 additional soldiers under General Post joined the Mexican camp. Santa Ana, confident the Texans would never strike his superior numbers, put no soldiers on watch. It would be his fatal mistake. At 3.30 in the afternoon on April 21st, obscured by trees and a small hill, the Texian army assembled. With rifles ready, they charged. The unexpected onslaught sent the Mexican army into a panic. The next few minutes were a storm of rifle fire and hand-to-hand -hand combat as Texans overwhelmed the Mexican side, shouting, remember the Alamo and remember Goliad. In a mere 18 minutes, the battle was over. 630 Mexicans lay dead and only nine Texans, one of the most decisive victories in military history. The grounds are covered with markers and stones fixed at locations critical to the battle. So this stone engraving marks the spot where President Santa Ana surrendered to General Sam Houston, putting the final stamp on Texas's independence. Makes you feel very proud standing here. One battle ended a revolution that had been boiling for years. A people struggling for their independence finally had it. And while this would be a great place to tie a pretty bow on this epic tale, well, Texas's story was far from over. You see, boiling blood can fuel a revolution, but it's not good for governing, and many battles still laid ahead. They have to answer a bunch of questions. How are they going to manage all those land grants? How are we going to pay for our debts? Who gets to be a citizen? They've got a significant number of enslaved people. We've still got a huge population from numerous different tribes, but in particular the Comanches, that also have a hold on this land we now call Texas. How do we manage the continuing threat of Mexico? And would it ever be possible to join the United States? A question that would be answered in 1845 when Texas became the 28th state admitted into the United States of America. And while the actual Republic of Texas may have only lasted nine years, the spirit of independence lives on. It's something that's breathed into every Texan from the moment they set foot on Texas soil, whether by birth or by relocation. We know we're proud, and sometimes a bit too loud, but we can't help it. We've been shouting ever since the battlefields of San Jacinto, and we won't be quiet now. So, hey, you wanna take this or should I? Okay, I'll do it. I'll see all y'all out on the road. Bye con Dios, amigos. Aha, yeah, we won, ah, oh, we won, ah. Hey, trip on over to thedaytripper.com to find travel guides and watch past episodes so you can hit the road yourself and have your own day trip adventures. See you on the road.